Hello. Morning, guys. Welcome to Facebook. Really great to have you out here today. Um, my name is Nathan Huggins, and I'm the account manager for the Irish market for Facebook. Um, we love working with the Dublin BIC. It's an event we've run a few times here, out here in Facebook, um, and we will continue to do so. Uh, when you look at what the D Dublin BIC do for, for startups in terms of helping them find funding and networking with great individuals like we have here in the room today, um, and I read online that 83% of the firms that Dublin BIC actually work with survive the first five years of their business. Um, and when you think about the turbulent times we live in, that's quite a, quite a feat, and I think it's a testament to, to Dublin BIC. Um, and here at Facebook, we like to think we share very similar values in, in the focus we want to put on startups. Uh, this year, we're going to align a lot of strategic support to working with scale-ups and startups um, to help them grow on our platform. Um, we're also going to be running more events like this um, in the near future. So we really want to put a big focus on Irish startups moving forward. Um, so we're really admiring what you guys here in the room do today. Um, and thank you very much for coming out today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Murray. I'm a business mentor with uh, Dublin BIC, and I'd like to extend my welcome to you here, here this morning as well. We have a, a really superb uh, program for you. Um, I'd like to thank our partners, uh, our hosts, of course, Facebook, OBH Partners, the UK Department of Trade, and uh, Smith and Will Williamson for uh, enabling this uh, event to happen. Um, <coughs> funding, the funding and scaling series of breakfast seminar events is really, really central to what we do in Dublin BIC, which is bringing together really innovative entrepreneurs with investors who are ready to um, uh, invest uh, in, in those companies. And uh, we've done that very, very successfully for, for many years, and we do that by having people like yourself here. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, so first up this morning, uh, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Travis George, CEO of Vela Games. Thanks, thanks Martin. Travis, thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, so uh, Travis and his uh, co-founders uh, came to Dublin BIC. Uh, I was just looking back on it. It was December 2017. Um, to talk to us about how we might support them in their journey. Um, we, I'm delighted to say that we get lots of games development companies coming into Dublin BIC and we're delighted to assist them. Uh, but I recognized straight away that uh, Vela Games was something quite different to what we usually see. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Travis tell you uh, why that's the case. So Travis, could you introduce us to Vela, Vela Games and give us just a hint as to how different you are? Thanks, Martin. Um, well, it's really great to be here. Uh, as Martin mentioned, uh, we met in December 2017. I actually met Michael before that um, through an introduction through um, uh, the th another CEO of another game company, actually, who's worked with you both. Um, so it's great to be here and, and talk a little bit about the company. Um, you know, Vela Games is um, a product of 40 years of collective kind of game industry uh, development and research experience between myself and the three co-founders, or the other two co-founders, the three of us. Um, and we really, we've worked in games and in and around games for years, and one of the things was that the timing was just right, which is always kind of important and an important factor. But we really came together with uh, the mission to really create epic gaming experiences that really unite players together. And we can talk a little bit more about what that means, but really it's, you know, multiplayer gaming is so huge at the moment and playing together can be such a powerful force in games. And that's not new. Uh, you know, people have been uh, making multiplayer games since basically the internet, you know, bulletin boards and uh, all kinds of things. But really trying to think about the evolution of that and the uh, the impact that games can have on people and their uh, their well-being and their relationships with people. Um, and so we really put the company together to, uh, you know, go create something that hopefully players can fall in love with and play for years and uh, have a great time with their friends. So, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot uh, that to unpack there, but that's kind of at the high level what we try to do. 
Okay, L let's take a step back for the uninitiated, and I definitely yeah. fell into that bracket uh, w when I met you. Uh, can you give us a, a, an overview of the games industry yeah. and where Vela positions itself in that? Yeah. So the global gaming market, we can throw out some numbers and 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 then quickly move on. But the global gaming market's about 140 billion dollars a year, give or take, uh, depending on. It's been growing for. Uh, basically as long as specialized gaming firms have been tracking it. Uh, but that includes all different types of gamers, games, and platforms, such as mobile phones, uh, mobile games, uh, what we call kind of enthusiast gamers that play in consoles or PC. Uh, and so you, you can really kind of slice that up. And of course, gaming is a very uh, global audience. You know, So there's people who enjoy playing games everywhere in the world uh, of all ages. So you know, that's kind of the very big picture. And there's been a couple interesting things happening over the years. So uh, myself and one of my co-founders, Brian, started in uh, working in professionally in games in early 2000s. And that was very much a time of, uh, you know, if you were an enthusiast gamer, you had a PlayStation or, you know, a Nintendo or some variant of one of those consoles along the way. And the distribution channels were extremely tightly controlled through the console manufacturers and the retailers that sold them. So um, basically, if you made a game and you could get into a retail channel through one of the big publishers that kind of controlled everything, people were going to notice it. And you were probably going to sell a good amount. Um, it was a very specialized industry. You know, we would take years to just build the technology to even, you know, make somebody run around on a screen. Whereas fast forward to today, you know, the democratization and kind of the uh, the destruction of the distribution. There's a lot of D's in there. The destruction of the distribution chain has really opened up the gaming market uh, to anybody and everybody. And one of the most popular game distribution platforms in the world is, is called Steam. For those aren't who uh, those of you who aren't familiar, uh, and it's basically it's an online store and community hub uh, that large developers, small developers can put their games on. This started out with one game, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, and it was the the company who makes Steam, Valve, was their own game. So they wanted to distribute their own game, uh, and they were tired of kind of the retail channel. To fast forward to today, uh, there's twice as many games released on Steam. Uh, last year than there was the previous year. And it's the number's in about 10,000. So 10,000 different games are released every year on this one platform, let alone the, th the, the hundreds of thousands of games that are released on mobile devices. And so this has just dramatically changed the landscape. Um, and so, you know, what we try to do is, uh, one, we try to position ourselves as close to uh, our most important relationship is with our players. And we try to position ourselves as close to our players in every way and have as much kind of accountability to our audience uh, as we can, which is kind of a scary thing for a, a game company to do because previously it was like, we just made the game and we don't talk to the players. There's other people who talk to the players, you know. Uh, just go back into the dark room and keep coding, you know. Um, and that's really, that can still happen, but we just really believe that that's, not the right way to do it, especially with the kind of the power of the distribution chain and, and the way that games uh, kind of, you know, capture the collective imagination of, of gamers around the world now. So we want to position ourselves as close to them as, as we can and make as many decisions as be as, as accountable as we can. If you were looking at it from kind of traditional industry definitions, we'd be almost a very vertically integrated game company. Like we want to have a direct hand in our distribution, uh, our publishing, our relationship management, our PR. Like we just really believe that like we shouldn't outsource the most important relationship that we have and pay someone in the traditional game industry uh, as a publisher uh, for the privilege of, of doing that less th less well than we think we can ourselves. So as a result of that, you are not going with the Steam distribution platform? Uh, well, well, that's a big commitment there. Or in your opinion, <laughs> yeah. um, but no, our plan is to actually, um, uh, let's put it this way, our plan is to solve our own distribution, okay. right? And so okay. the distribution uh, of games at the moment is very in flux. Uh, more players are coming in all the time. Um, and it's quite, uh, there's quite a big upheaval happening at this very moment. Um, so we want to solve that ourselves, uh, and it is a continuing trend. So previously, I worked at um, at work. I worked at Riot Games, and Riot Games distributes League of Legends, and uh, we did all of that ourselves. Um, 
if, if anybody's played or I'm sure you've heard of Fortnite, uh, the company that makes that, Epic Games, actually has their own distribution. They distribute the game themselves. Um, except when they want to play on consoles, they have to go in and work with the console manufacturers because those are closed platforms. Uh, but they can go leverage very good deals that other developers couldn't previously because the popularity of the game, which I think just shows the traditional way that um, the games market used to work was through the distribution channel that was very tightly controlled by retailers and uh, console manufacturers. Whereas today, it's it's very uh, it's very loose and free, but it's very uh, heavily heavily influenced by the content, right? And so it's it's much more about the content now. The distribution is a mechanism and a tool. Uh, I'm sure people would be interested to hear. Uh, what can you tell us about the game you're developing without having to kill me with a laser beam? Oh, well, so games, um, making the type of game that we're making, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on if you're a creator, uh, you want more time. If, if you're uh, kind of in the traditional startup mentality, you want as little time as possible. Uh, so that's kind of a constant, interesting balance that we're always trying to, to strive for. Um, but we're trying to create a game and uh, we're trying to create a game that is essentially a, uh, what we would say, a new genre of gameplay. Um, so we want to take familiar ingredients that enthusiast gamers, uh, so we're you know, work, uh, working with enthusiast gamers, so people who play uh, on PC or consoles uh, or mobile phones as well, but they're kind of platform agnostic. They go where the content is. They go where their friends are. Um, so we're trying to create something for them uh, that takes familiar ingredients uh, from other genres of games and combines them into kind of a new recipe. Is it's a very interesting proposition where you can actually, in the game space, that you wouldn't think this, but you can actually go be very innovative in the, the gameplay formula and actually very commercially successful. If you look at the top 10 games for enthusiast gamers, many of the, over half of them are kind of new genres or new gameplay types that have kind of evolved over the years. Um, and so we're very fortunate to kind of have that positioning. Um, and then more specifically, we are creating an original IP, so original universe, uh, original characters uh, that players will uh, get to interact with. Uh, we're going to uh, operate the game as a service, which means that we're not working for all this time uh, over these years and then uh, going to a retail distribution, selling the, the product for 70 euros uh, a piece and hoping that we make up all of our money in about a month, which is kind of that model. Mm -hmm. um, instead, we'll be operating the game as an ongoing service uh, where we'll actually be able to directly interact with players, directly incorporate feedback into the product and the experience, uh, and then evolve the, the service and evolve the content and evolve the gameplay and hopefully grow the audience over many years. Okay, um, if I could stop you there. Yeah. Um, Every investor is looking to invest in a team that has deep domain knowledge and other diverse skills. Can you tell us about the career traje trajectory of yourself and the other co-founders of Vela? Yeah, so when we sit down and, and we think about, you know, what kind of company do we want Vela to be, um, you know, we consistently keep coming back to, we want Vela to be uh, a place where uh, world-class talent can do their best work. And so that, um, you know, we, think of ourselves a lot as facilitators for that talent. Um, but at the same time, we also um, hopefully have at least enough experience to know what we're doing wrong and, and hopefully a little bit of what we're doing right. Um, so uh, myself, I've started in games around 2002 uh, and I've worked in development uh, the whole time. So I was a game designer for most of my career, which uh, if you're not familiar with all the game industry lingo, uh, I was responsible for making sure that the thing was fun because uh, otherwise it's just software, it's just expensive software, um, it's not fun. Uh, and then in the second half of my career, uh, I worked in uh, kind of game direction or product management for games. Um, I worked at uh, Activision on the large console uh, uh, kind of third-party publishing side. Uh, and then the second half of my career, I was very fortunate to join Riot Games uh, early on. Uh, they make League of Legends, which is one of the biggest PC games in the world. Uh, there's currently about 100 million active monthly users there. Uh, and I was there from the time when we were 15 people to, and I left in late 2016, uh, about 2,500 people uh, at that point. Uh, took some time off, uh, did an MBA at Trinity College, uh, and then started uh, co-founded Vela. My other two co-founders who are in the audience up here, you can come say hi to them. Uh, Brian and Lisa, 
So uh, Brian Kaiser, I met in university uh, in the States in 2002. We went to the same degree program. We both realized at the same time that we didn't like game programming, uh, much to the chagrin of our wallets, uh, because game programming is by far the most uh, popular and in-demand um, uh, position. By the way, if you're a programmer in C++ and you like games, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, we have a <laughs> lucrative career opportunity. Um, but uh, So Brian's worked in game design uh, and creative design, so he kind of stayed more in the game design track where I moved more to product management. Uh, and so he's worked on some of the most uh, you know high-profile franchises. Uh, he worked at Activision with me, uh, and then Electronic Arts on the Sims franchise, and actually created new IP there, uh, and recently just worked on, uh, he was the one of the game and narrative leads for uh, Electronic Arts' recent mobile game, Command & Conquer uh, Red Alert, which is very popular if you're familiar with Command & Conquer series. Uh, and then my other co-founder uh, is Dr. Lisa Nuon george and she's actually spent uh, over a decade, uh, she's a social scientist, and she has a PhD in linguistic anthropology, uh, and she's actually spent over a decade studying uh, game communities and the cultures that kind of shape uh, those communities and how developers actually interact and co-create uh, that sense of belonging around an experience. Uh, and so after she finished her degree in academia, uh, she actually decided she wanted to work in the industry. Uh, she had worked briefly at Riot Games in 2009 uh, before launch uh, and then decided she actually wanted to return. Uh, and she was uh, worked in the Dublin office actually uh, and eventually was the head of insights for Riot Games in Europe. Uh, there. And so we all kind of found ourselves in the right place at the right time and uh, ended up in Dublin together. So one of the reasons I asked you that question is because it helps explain why from a standing start back in late 2017, you've had some fairly serious success in your funding journey. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yeah, so we set out and um, the traditional kind of trajectory in the game industry is uh, have a game idea, uh, get a team to work for free, uh, and then go sign a publishing deal to make the rest of the game. Um, we knew that that was just wasn't the right path for us. It's, it's certainly a very valid path. We knew that wasn't the right path for us. Um, so we sat down and said, what kind of company do we want to be? Uh, what kind of space do we want to operate in? And what are our unique strengths? Um, it, it's not actually sitting down and coding the game. Uh, you know, we said our unique strengths are our ability to kind of look strategically at the market uh, and build a great team that can create that experience. Um, and so we spent about, um, you know, we all started working full time around late 2017, early 2018. Uh, and we spent basically last year figuring out who we were as a company, what space we were going to operate in, and then fundraising. Um, you know, the fundraising journey we always knew was going to be hard. Uh, we knew the right partner was out there somewhere for us who wanted to bet on us as a company and less so on like the specific project because games always change and evolve like it's a part of the natural process. Um, you know, and so we, we were very fortunate uh, to have a lot of great contacts and a lot of great networks both in the US, uh, the UK, here. Um, and so it was a great kind of first, we were all first time entrepreneurs, so it was a great kind of learning experience going through the process with, you know, game specific funds, general venture funds, um, you know, private funds, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, and so where we finally landed uh, late last year is we have a, a mix of, um, uh, we have a lead investor from the private sector, uh, and then also, uh, I saw Joe Healy here, I don't know if he knows me, but I know him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're going to a uh, committee with Enterprise Ireland for the HPSU program as well tomorrow, and that will hopefully just kind of tie off our uh, seven-figure seed round. Uh, seven-figure seed round. That's right. Okay. Yeah, multiple seven figures. Yeah. I'm going to. Th that's an excellent point to stop it, and we're we're going to uh, go to a very very brief uh, Q and A. So if anybody has a question, we have a roving mic uh, going around there. Yeah, we have one here, Laura. Hi, Travis. I am um, one word that was in vogue a few years ago, but I didn't hear was the word disruption um, and disruption in the in the game sector. And mm -hmm. um, my question uh, coming from the fintech space is, are there any notes that you can kind of identify with in terms of disruption in the fintech space that remind you of what happened with the game industry, like the distribution channels and so on? Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm finance is kind of a hobby of mine, um, <laughs> which is weird. Um, 
most people's work in finance, maybe their hobbies games. So maybe that's how it works. Um, but um, you know, so I'm not I'm not intimately familiar with the fintech space. Um, but I do think that you know, kind of the democratization of um, con you know, kind of control of the system was you know, a huge turning point for games. And you know, we were very fortunate to be able to take advantage of that at Riot Games and actually create something that we could kind of bypass the traditional gatekeepers at every turn. Um, you know. There's a there's a huge convention in uh, gaming called E3, and it's basically like it's this big huge show where all the games come out. And the first time I ever went, I was so excited. I thought it was this big important industry conference. But what I realized was it's actually for all the retail buyers from like Walmart and like all the big chains. And that's the only thing that really kind of determined your game's success. You know, it didn't matter whether people liked it or not. And so now I think that with the democratization that's kind of happened, it's probably very similar in fintech where you know, the idea of I don't have to put up with my bank anymore and I can just go to where there's actually the right service for me um, and, you know, people pick up the phone when I talk to them. Like, that's a crazy idea. And so I think it really comes down to this idea of the traditional game industry didn't think a lot about what's the actual player experience. How are we actually taking that feedback on board? So, I mean, I, that's how we did it. And that was very different at the time. Um, I think it's just about you have to create a great offering. We might have time for just one more question. Uh, sorry, there's a few at the back here. Isn't there? Yeah, thanks. That, that kind of following up on that, I'm interested in what Lisa, your linguistic anthropologist, does I, 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 uh, in terms of um, keeping up to speed with exactly how your your users feel about your product. So yeah. So at the moment, uh, we don't have a product or users. So uh, <laughs> you know, we're uh, we're working on that. <laughs> Um, games take a long time to make, everybody. Um, you know, multiple years. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, again, just briefly, to we try to do things the way that we think is the best way, not necessarily to be different. But it, it would be different for most companies to have someone like Lisa on the team from day one. You know, you would expect, like, we have an engineer. We, we didn't start with an engineer on our team, which is crazy because we're a software. You know, we make software. Um, but Lisa's on the team because of, uh, you know, her experience uh, kind of understanding communities and player interaction with developers in a very unique way. Uh, and so, you know, the way that, uh, you know, she impresses on us and, and that we all do is, you know, we interact with communities of games. We're players ourselves. Uh, you know, we're always kind of looking and, and seeing, like, uh, both from our own perspective and what other players do. And then, of course, we look at, you know, market trends and, and kind of data that's happening. Uh, but I think more importantly, it's, it's anybody can go look at a report. It's much more about being involved in that community and understanding the motivations of, of players and kind of what drives them. So kind of our, one of our core thesis for the actual product itself is based around uh, you know, some research around player motivations in other genres, not necessarily demographics and age and country locale. It's more about we're trying to find an audience based on what they are motivated by and what they care about. And so, you know, what Lisa brings and kind of keeps up with is, you know, we're all players, we're all part of communities. Uh, and until we have our own, um, you know, we're all uh, in a small, you know, high growth startup. So she, like everybody else, does a little bit of everything, you know, so... Uh, you know, we pay the bills and make sure, you know, we do a lot of recruiting uh, and everything. And so we're all doing that at the moment. Very so. good. Travis, thank you for that. I'm going to stop it there. Travis, you are staying around for the rest of the morning. I will be here. Right. Uh, um, and Brian and Lisa are here Lisa also. Lisa and Brian are here also uh, if you have any more questions for them. Uh, could I ask you to show your appreciation for Travis, please? Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Carmody uh, with Dublin Big Also, So just moving along nicely, I'd like to ask uh, Mark Lowry uh, to come and join us. Mark is the scale-up lead with Smith & Williamson. They're one of the top 10 advisory firms here in Dublin, working with scale-ups, working with startups, um, offering advice, guidance on the journey. So Mark, if you'd come up and join us, and I know you're going to have a quick conversation with Adrian Welsh from Check Ventry. So I'll hand it over to Thanks you guys and let you move along. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. So... Uh, Thanks so much for joining us this morning, Adrian. Hello. Really Pleasure appreciate you being here. So I, I think we're going to focus today on the uh, on the funding journey and how that has helped your scale-up journey. 
or not, as the case may be. So uh, maybe you give us a quick elevator pitch as to uh, what Checkman Tree does. Um, very simply, Checkman Tree is a, uh, a platform where we check inventory. It's as simple as that. Uh, es essentially, uh, our customers are really, we focus on the automotive market, on the automotive finance market. So to give you a reason why we exist is, if you go to a dealership and you see all the lovely shiny cars out the front, the dealer isn't a millionaire uh, or a billionaire. The, all those lovely cars are funded by the bank. Uh, and in many cases, the bank never gets to see the vehicles. Uh, and if you're going to fund, uh, if you're going to fund stock, used car dealers are generally not the top of the credit worthiness list uh, within it, within a bank, uh, just from a, a credit management point of view. So, banks put in lots of checks and balances so that they can make sure that the vehicles that are on funding are, are actually there. Um, so if you think about it from the point of view of when you go for your mortgage and all of the paperwork that goes involved in that, uh, when you go to sell your house, there's lots of paperwork involved in that. The, with a the car dealer, um, when they sell a car, there's far less paperwork involved in that. So y they could sell the assets and keep the proceeds as working capital. So we eliminate that risk, essentially, Fair facilitate it. trade. So ri risk <coughs> management for finance companies, yeah. essentially. Uh, yeah, uh, well, that's, that's what we started out at, is really our, f our customers being the banks, uh, but that's kind of evolved whereby the banks being our primary users, the dealers who are actually, uh, essentially, they're auditing the vehicles on our platform, we found that we were able to solve a huge amount of operational risks for the dealers, so our customers' customers are now our customers also, uh, which makes for an interesting dynamic as well on, on, on the platform. So <coughs> going back in time, 2013, uh, and you're a sole founder, which is a little bit different from, from mm. Vela Games. Uh, so you're, uh, you have this great idea. Yeah. So talk to me about how you got went about funding that uh, and how you went about building the business from scratch. Okay, uh, gosh, it seems like an awful long time ago now, uh, although uh, I'm, I'm wearing the scars, but well, the, I think what, what we have, uh, I, I worked in the automotive industry at a, at a senior level, so I saw this problem all the time. I was trying to help dealers, to our fund dealers, but I was hamstrung by, by some of the uh, uh, rules and regulations and credit uh, checks that would be, were in place. So I kind of validated the idea with my peers without necessarily knowing them knowing that I was planning to, 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 to develop a business from it. I left um, a major motor uh, distributor and uh, then just basically thought, this is great, I've got a good idea, I've got good contacts, I've got good domain knowledge, this is going to be easy. So I spoke to my wife and said, right, give me three months and we'll, you know, I'm going to give this a go and, and, and see, how we, see how we go, but we should, be, we should be cash positive within three months. Um, so uh, she keeps on asking me if the three months <laughs> up yet, but the, the, the uh, but essentially that, that's th my na my naivety was that I had blind faith in in the fact that I knew the the domain and uh, that it was a good idea, so I I went about um, um, actually arson around probably is the best way of putting it for a few months until I realised that actually this is not the way to to do this. So I joined uh, the New Frontiers program and uh, just got a little bit of structure around it. And then from that, the journey kind of really started, which is around the tail end of, of 2013. Um, so I got a little bit of funding from the Kent Enterprise Board, Leo as it is now, uh, that helped. Then the New Frontiers program, that uh, actually does a, a, a stipend uh, funding for that. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of I bootstrapped for, for a couple of years. I had some savings that I built up which again, at the start, I thought, this is deadly. All I have to do is really pay myself or, or look after my own costs and, and uh, we can go on for quite some time. That doesn't work out that way either. Um, and then I got to the point whereby after a few months, not the three months that I promised my wife, but after about nine months or so, we actually started uh, being able to invoice customers, which was pretty brilliant. Not, not, not big invoices that I thought we'd have, but they're invoices nevertheless. So with that, we kind of had validated the, the, the idea to the point whereby customers were engaging with us. Um, and then so, I... So if you don't mind, just in terms of the funding piece here, so part yep. of the key funding piece here is, uh, yeah, you're getting some cash in externally, yep. but you're also burning your own cash, yep. but also free labor because you're essentially yeah. uh, part of the funding story here. And the other piece then is in terms of risk management, in terms of product development, you did a lot of that outsource. Yes, so yeah, so I wasn't paying myself, so hence the cash management within the business was great. The the family savings were dwindling significantly, and then the um, and then what I did is from a development point of view, I'm not a developer, couldn't code for Toffee, so essentially um, I outsourced that, 
and um, I, I asked a few people, got a good recommendation, and engaged with a with a good company doing that. So that was fine. I had enough for kind of a you know a, a, a high fidelity minimum viable product is probably the best way of putting it, um, and that was enough for us to to engage with customers with. But all the time I'm managing the cash flow. Uh, and uh, you know, which is dwindling all the time. Uh, but every little bit of every euro that comes in is is significant. But essentially, we got to the point whereby we could engage with. Now you can engage with VCs at a very early stage, and and you know, if you've got a really credible story and stuff like that, you know, sometimes they'll engage with you without having a product and without having a, the customers. With us, it was always the kind of like the nodding head of, oh, that's really interesting. But you know, come back to us when you've got a customer. So then we came back when we had a customer and we got the nodding head and going, yeah, come back to us when you got a bigger customer. So we had that kind of whole journey, but we, we ended up um, engaging with uh, Elkstone. Um, so, oh, so how long down your journey? Uh, is this, is, this, is, uh, at the, uh, this is in 2015. So we, 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 had, we had a couple of customers on board, some decent sized, or decent names, shall we say. The, the deal sizes weren't huge, but, but good names and, and, and adding value and great recommendations. And we'd won a few competitions as well, which kind of was a proxy for customers to, to a degree. That had brought in a little bit of cash flow as well, which is great. So, so let's have a think about the cash here. So you, ha you have 7K from Leo <coughs> or thereabouts, 15 from New Frontiers. You've gone into the competitive startup oh, yeah. program with Enterprise Ireland, another 50K. Yeah. But that's only 70K. Yeah. And that's over 13 and 14. So it's quite a long period of time. But very tail in the, the 13. Really, that, that goes through 14 and, and, and the start of 15. So what was the mistakes you were making at that point in terms of... Uh, I was being too conservative because I was burning my own cash. Uh, way too conservative. We should have actually been out there. I wasn't, I wasn't... I thought we had the best idea ever, but it was my idea and I didn't want people robbing it. So it was kind of like telling enough to engage with customers, but not telling enough to actually engage with the wider audience and, and bring people in. Um, I had a great team, but they were all volunteers. Uh, so I was, I was cashing in an awful lot of personal mm -hmm. currency, if you like, a, a, a brand, um, and our personal credit, should I say. So the, uh, but but the the likes of engaging with the Elkstone, um, that was a that was a turning point because uh, they we were too small actually for their seed fund. We weren't looking for a huge amount of money. We were looking for half a million, but a lot of money. But you know, from a from a VC point of view, not not big enough for for what they were looking at. But um, Alan Merriman uh, and Declan, uh, they they liked what we were doing, so so they actually uh, invested and EI co-invested. Now that was huge, and I thought half a million quid was more money than we'd ever need. Um, We've just done a second round, so it wasn't uh, uh, more money than we needed. But so, so in terms of that VC engagement, in terms of that that sort of what were the critical things? So you would have been talking to a lot of VCs. You had to kiss a lot of frogs before you found your prince. But what essentially were the things that persuaded, or do you think persuade a VC to take you seriously and to make that you know sign that check? All of the above. I mean, like uh, the fact the fact that the domain knowledge was key. Obviously, they they invest in team. In our case, we had we did have a great team, but it was a solo founder, so that's always risky. And I think probably the, the if I were to go back, probably one of the key things I would do is I would bring more. I would I would co have a co-founder. Um, that in itself, not just from an investability point of view, but actually from sharing the pain or the and the joys that go along. Because it's the stakeholder management is is incredible. Um, you know, one of my biggest stakeholders is my wife. Uh, she she had faith in what we we're doing. I couldn't tell her some of the stuff that was going on because you know then she's going to worry about the you know the the, the family and, and how we're going to pay for the for the gas bill. So the um, yeah, so this, the stakeholder management is is difficult. So I think a co-founder really uh, unshackles you in relation to that. Uh, you know, and, you know more 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 heads are better than one, but. Um, that would be the, probably the key thing I'd do, and I think we would have got investment earlier for that. Um, I say Elkstone uh, really, uh, thankfully, in invested in us. Uh, they saw something. Uh, Alan, his his former experience was in the area of wholesale uh, finance, so he he's when I explained to him what we were doing, he knew that pain, and he could see this is actually a good solution for it. So, so uh, I know I know Peter and, and Joe from Enterprise Ireland are, are in the audience tonight. I know they're you, a really important part of your story as well, and in terms of persuading the VC, yeah, to come on board. Uh, so, so uh, like Elkstone, Elkstone were, were reasonably new in investing in Ireland at the time, and uh, they had not done a co-investment with Enterprise Ireland. So when I was when I had when I had Elkstone engaged, and I said actually, and and EI are responding very positively to us, and there's an opportunity for them to co-invest. That de-risked it more than double de-risked it essentially because even though you're getting you know uh, co-investment of matched funding it's 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 not only the additional funding which obviously you know extends your runway but it's also the the fact that you're going to uh, have the 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 cooperation of a very significant uh, partner in that 
Uh, and EI, again, in the second round, were very, very instrumental in that. I, I'm not sure we would have uh, got the second round through as quickly as we did without EI's involvement at all. So let's step back from the second round. You've got you know, roughly half a million in terms of investment. You've, uh, you've got some uh, initial funding. You're now, def you're now generating cash flow. Uh, and you think you've a runway now for development of the product and kicking on in terms of developing your distribution strategy. Um, what, uh, did you think you got enough at that time? And in hindsight, did you get enough? To First do time what you want to do? Yeah. It, Joe, it's the art of the doable. I, I, having kissed the frogs uh, and not getting anywhere, it, you know, once somebody says, starts engaging with you, at whatever that amount that you've said that they'll engage with you, you you'll seize with both hands. Um, realistically, yeah, th th we would have definitely benefited from having more. And uh, you know, there's things that you'll do when you're when you're either bootstrapping or when you're when you're really focused on the cash flow. There, it's not only the things that you don't do, but it's actually your mindset as well. So, when I'm because I'm quite you know uh, cash flow literate at this stage, uh, the you know if I'm quoting for a customer, that's influencing how much I'm actually going to quote them because I'm going how much do I need the cash from this customer or not, and that can have a very significant influence. It's not even about the customer pushing back on a price; it's about my own you know perception before I even go in, simply because I'm I'm thinking of the bank account rather than thinking of the opportunity. Uh, and that has a very, you know, significant effect uh, because uh, I I was the, the 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 only salesperson within the organization, so I was making those those uh, decisions. That was actually the other thing. I was the only salesperson in the organization. Really bad idea. Um, I'm I, I can sell. I'm absolutely not the best salesperson at all. But also, when you're dealing with a customer, we're doing B2B selling. They're negotiating with the founder of the company, so they're going to get. You know, I can't go back and say, well, actually, I can't do that. I have to talk to my boss. It, it really it, it, it takes that layer out of it. So we now have sales guys and they're constantly coming back to me saying, actually, I have a bit of pushback on price. And I'm saying, go away and get the price and we'll get the price simply because they've got somebody that they can come back to that can tell them to go away again. I didn't have that luxury. Um, so, so, so you didn't ha you didn't get enough essentially. Uh, didn't get enough. Journey. Funny, no. Because, but there's, uh, because the key never. things you did, I guess, at that stage was in housing development, yeah, in housing things, product yeah. development. All that. first investment was about you know growing growing the team. So we have we, we we did bring people in. Uh, like when we got the investment, I we I was the only full time employee in, in the company. Um, but so with the investment, we immediately in house the team. We, we got in uh, a couple of. Brilliant techies who are, who are still with us, very instrumental in, in, in what we've been doing. Um, and Emer, who was uh, a good pal of mine, who was volunteering up to that point, she came in, left her left her, her proper job, as we called it, and uh, and came and worked with us, and is still with us and has grown phenomenally within that role. So she's our queen bee, kind of looking after uh, a huge amount of stuff. Um, and uh, then that core team, then we've we've grown out from that uh, a little bit, but we still we still deal with contractors, but we still have a, a, a core team, and that was. The money allowed us to do that, and that's been phenomenally uh, effective. So, if I'm hearing you right, your focus on the internal operational building, yeah, versus the external sales operation was yeah, probably where use, the balance wasn't yeah. right. I didn't, I didn't invest the first round of funding. I did get sales in, but we didn't really put enough focus on it. So, um, kissed a few frogs there as well in relation <laughs> to the sales thing. But you know, also, I don't think I was at. A, I, I don't think the company was at a point where we were able to help salespeople the way that we didn't have proper sales structures and collateral and 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 all of the devices that are required. So, this round of funding, we've kind of said, look, this is all about sales. So. Uh, you know, we've already got uh, a couple of very significant international partnerships signed up in the, in the last uh, uh, couple of months. They're already starting to uh, give dividend. We've engaged with an external marketing company that, again, is 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 really uh, proving very valuable to us. Lots of stuff that we should have been doing that we just weren't simply because we were minding the the money. But by the same token we're still alive and you, you, we wouldn't be here if I, if I hadn't been as focused on the financial plan, uh, cash flow management. Yeah. So there's a real trade off there. I, I'm kicking myself about some of the opportunities I didn't go for, but at the same time, by not going for those opportunities, I was able to manage the cash flow. So, so one thing we were discussing last night was your, your engagement with your stakeholders through this period to actually get to the second round stage. And yep. you were saying there was a couple of lessons that you, you felt needed Needed to be learned. Yeah, I, th I, well. I, I think like I, I again starting the company, I was hugely naive, but also the funding journey. I thought, great idea, I'm going to get funding. It's going to be easy. It wasn't at all. But even actually the second round, I, I, I kind of took for granted that you know we were making progress, that there'd be a second round. But I, I, I'd left that very late. 
Uh, so when I went back to the investors and said, actually, do you know, what, you know, we're starting to to see a dry patch uh, going ahead here. We we need to go again. That wasn't news that they were necessarily ready for. Uh, hadn't done a good job in the stakeholder management there. Now they were great in the way they responded to it, but but that was certainly something for me uh, that um, I need to, to to focus on better. So I guess uh, we're now coming to the end of 2018. You've gone through a, a growth journey. You're now internationalising your business. Yes. Uh, and uh, Elkstone and Enterprise Ireland are back in now for a follow-on round. Yep. Uh, and what are your plans with that additional funding? Pretty much 99% of it is, is uh, sales and marketing activities. And as I say, we've, we've signed up a couple of, of uh, uh, external partners, uh, really important ones. Um, and actually, it, it's amazing. It's like customers have found out that we've got funding because <laughs> so our pipeline is starting to now. We're, we're actually too busy, which uh, don't let them know. But, but the, 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 everything just seems to be happening now. So we're having a phenomenally good quarter. Uh, and um, you know opportunities that were dormant essentially uh, have now just come alive uh, which is really uh, encouraging so, so there was a few lessons i think from from what you've been saying to us here this morning which i hope will be good takeaways for for those burgeoning entrepreneurs and and those at, at different stages so the first thing is in terms of uh, engaging with people earlier having those conversations and being more open would that be fair yes definitely uh, the no second thing is get your sales team up and running earlier uh, and the third thing is engage with your investors in a more active way on the basis that you're going to have to go yeah. back to the well at some point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Super. Okay. Thank you. Maybe Thank you. Yeah, give them a round of applause. Um, Thank you. We have, we have a minute. We have the roving mic. Has anyone got a question that they'd like maybe for Adrian or for Mark before we move on? Anyone want to, uh, to, to challenge to pick up anything there? I'll be cash flow positive in three months. The yeah. Well done, Nate. I know. Yeah. I, I met know. you five years ago. <laughs> yeah. that, was the, that was some successful stakeholder management. <laughs> Are we okay? Brilliant. We'll move on. Okay. Guys, thank, thank you, you Mark. Very much. Adrian, thank you very much thank for you. coming in. Really Good appreciate that. Okay, so we'll move along, and I'll ask my colleague Heidi Kaur to uh, come along, and Heidi's in conversation with Brendan, um, and I think... Brendan's here. Yep, there you are. Hi, Brendan and Heidi. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Brendan. Haven't seen you. I wasn't sure if you were going to arrive because, yeah. firstly, congratulations <laughs> on the birth of your daughter, Katie, Thank you. from all of us at Dublin Bic and everyone in the room. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brendan and I first met in 2012 when himself and a co-founder, Des Anderson, actually started a virtual business. Uh, Des was based in Belgrade in Serbia and uh, Brendan came to me and I wondered why I only ever met Brendan and because his co-founder was in Serbia. Um, there were also, I think, three additional... Um, sweat, sweat equity developers. Developers, yeah. yeah, that were involved. And when I met Brendan, I knew I, knew I was kind of dealing with a very um, determined, forthright gentleman because... Brendan always focused on sales and his whole philosophy was about selling and looking after his end customer. So very similar to Travis this morning, it was very much about the end customer. So where Brendan's journey has taken him is in 2012 and 2013, where you started off with 12 customers paying $99 Total. recurring revenue at 12, so bringing in 1,200 monthly revenue and employing two people. Yeah, not or paid. For free, <laughs> not paid, as, yeah. as normal, and eating baked beans on toast. Whereas today, Brendan now is at 85 staff, and by the end of 2018, did 8 million recurring revenue. So that is a very significant achievement. So I think, first of all, congratulations, Brendan. So, Brendan, we're here today to talk about scaling, and scaling is certainly something that what you are doing at the moment your goal for the end of 2019 i think is 15 million 2020 you're very clear with your goals 25 million and 2025 100 million well that's the plan yeah <laughs> that's the plan um so tell us a bit learn upon was very clear on what you actually wanted to be in the early days with the lms yeah so um so we we're a cloud-based learning management system uh, so companies use our platform to deliver online training to their employees, partners, customers, resellers. Um, when we started, myself and Des worked in the space for eight and 12 years previously. So we had a lot of domain knowledge. 
Um, but and I suppose that gave us insights to the frustrations on the, the platforms that were in the market at the time. Um, so it's a very crowded space. I think that's one of the challenges we had when it came to raising money. Talking to VCs in the early days, you know, we were loosely categorized as just another LMS. And um, it's difficult to kind of, I found it difficult to get the vision across. I, we knew we weren't just another LMS, um, but that, that is difficult to articulate. Um, uh, obviously, over time, I suppose, you know, it gets, it gets, it gets easier when you have uh, a, a track record to refer to. Um, on the plus side, it is a crowded space. Um, but the market is huge, so there's a huge there's a reason why there's uh, pick a figure seven eight hundred LMSs on the market. Companies need them. Um, so uh, in terms of actually demand, companies every day searching for a platform like ours that was already there. Um, we just had to get ourselves above the crowd, uh, get visibility. Once people saw our platform, they realised it was streets ahead of every other solution on the market. Um, then it was relatively easy to get sales, I think. Yeah. So um, your first funding round, Brendan, I think was 550,000. Yeah, we did uh, 50k CSF yeah. the EI before that, and then we did the HPSU round. Um, the CSF was May 2012, and we did HPSU in December 2013, uh, which was 550. Yeah. And you were telling me there on Tuesday you closed on... Uh, yeah, you had term sheets, sorry, term, you had term yeah, sheets. Yeah, we got uh, the term sheet that we knew we were going to go with on the Paddy's Day, so the 17th of March, and we closed on the 20th of December. So in terms of how long, and, and actually the investors we went with was an angel investor that I knew since I was 17, so we were friends, uh, plus um, some family and Enterprise Ireland. So it, uh, even when we knew the investors very well, it still took nine months to close the funding round. So um, it, uh, again, I suppose from lessons learned, and if I'm talking, you know, say, to newer companies that are starting to raise, that's always a thing that I highlight, like it's going to take time to get through all the hoops to actually close the round. We were lucky the investors actually um, uh, put in half the money up front on signing the term sheet. Uh, but there was still an overhang there. If we didn't get through legals and get it closed, we had to give that money back. So you're, do you spend it or do you not spend it? So. What, what do you think, like, because obviously that's a long period, that's nine months. So how, how do you survive? How do you survive that nine months from, you know, you've got the term sheet to then actually drawing down the funds? There must have been a, um, a different difficult period there yeah it was tough i mean uh, very like travis's story i we lived a lot off savings um which uh, disappeared very quickly <laughs> quicker than you'd expect um for that a lot of that period what money we spent we were very cash efficient so we um we we didn't spend a lot of money we we hired i think over that period we started to hire a couple of people later in the year so around september october november we hired our first real staff like that we actually had to pay and um it was we knew we were nearly there on the fund and at that stage so we were a bit more confident to okay let's we need to get these people into the business the other side is we had paying customers not a lot but uh by the end of 2013 we had about 70 paying customers we'd maybe a couple of hundred grand in annual recurring revenue coming in so we were you know that was able to pay some rent get servers you know marketing etc um so there was that balancing act all the time we were always very focused that um you know that we wouldn't have to raise a huge amount of money that we could get customers to pay for the growth of the business you um you actually said to me on Tuesday that the second round which you raised I think was 675,000 and yeah. that was 2016 um, you probably didn't really need, but it helped you move into your nice new offices on Aaron Key. Yeah, I'd say at the time we were we still had most of the first round, like we'd. But what was happening is we were the business was growing, and while we weren't burning a huge amount of cash, our balance sheet didn't look great. So we were starting to sell to bigger companies, and if they did any due diligence on us, they were just like red flags all over the place. So we felt we needed to just get some extra cash into the business. Um, and yeah, like we, we moved from a small office in Leeson Street into a, a much bigger office in Dublin. We were starting to expand in the US, in Sydney. Um, and so we kind of had capital expenditure um, as uh, more so than day-to-day -day running expenses that we needed. So that second round helped with that. It just shored up the, the cash and balance sheet a bit. Um, it's actually an interesting key takeaway that when you're dealing with uh, larger customers, um, 
for everyone in the audience, it's that when they do the due diligence on you and if they realise the size of your company, yeah. it could actually impact some of the larger contracts. With, the, with your growth that you've experienced, I came into your office and one wall is full of the hun first 100 customers, uh, no more room now because there's over 1,000 yeah. paying customers. Um, the other side of the room, you've got endless awards that you've actually won. Mm -hmm. And I asked you a question, which award, because there were so many and way too many to mention, which one was most important to you? Yeah, um, and I was saying, saying, yeah, the one that kind of from, from a personal level means a lot to me, actually we entered the SME awards. Um, that, so it was a local Irish awards. They're not hugely big, but Damien Mully does a great job running them. We entered them a couple of years ago, um, let's say back in 2014 and again in 2015. Uh, and we won the one for best customer support, which again, just the ethos of the company and the culture of the company, that actually meant a lot more than, to me than some of the other like Brandon Hall and various other awards, industry awards that we've won. Um, I think it kind of reinforced, you know, we've invested so much in that area of the business. Um, our first hire, Shane, was in customer support. He's still with us five years later. And as we've grown all our team, support is still our biggest team. And it's where a lot of companies see it as a cost center and they try to get economies of scale and cut back when they get to a certain level because they think, right, we've enough there to get by. We're actually the opposite. We have cash to play with now yeah. and uh, we double down in support. We've taken our metrics for the number of support people per customer. We're actually driving it down and, and spending more on it because we think longer term, that's ultimately what will help us win. So uh, there's some uh, reoccurring themes. Customer centric is is absolutely key for the majority of businesses and everything coming from the customer's point of view. Scaling. If we look at your scaling, Brendan, um, and you know, um, Mark and Adrian were speaking earlier about some of the impacts of scaling. Scaling also has personal impacts. And I know when we were chatting, um, there were some quite personal impacts for yourself. Yeah, I think you go through different stages. Um, like there's a, it's a very exciting phase, I think, around like say 10 to 15 people when you're all in maybe one relatively small room and everyone is interacting and there's a great buzz around the business and, and, and everyone is doing. And I, what I found, particularly in the early days, like I love doing, I can't code, so Des looked after that, but you know, sales, marketing, writing blog posts, answering support tickets, you know, taking out the trash, whatever it is needed to be done, I would do it and, and I, I, I enjoyed that and you could see the productive, like what's called that productive work of what you're doing. As you move up through the stages, I think once you go kind of past 20 people and then again past 50 people, your role um, changes along the way. Um, I, I was mentioned to Heidi when we were chatting the other day, like when you start a company, you, you start a company because you have a vision and you've, there's something you want to build and you hope it'll be successful. You don't start a company because you want to be CEO. Um, you just, you kind of end up there um, because someone has to be. Um, uh, you know, if things work out well and you start growing and get to the different stages, suddenly you're actually, yeah, you're CEO now and you have a job to do here and, and it's actually not the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so I, I kind of found that transition quite difficult. You, at, at some point you feel a bit of a fraud because you're now telling people what to do as opposed to actually doing it yourself. Um, I think you can kind of, when you're doing things yourself, you can go, yeah, that was a good day, I did that. Look what I, I did that demo today or I got that invoice out or whatever it is. Uh, and yeah, so I don't, nowadays my, my, my role is very different and yeah, you get used to it, I think, over time. And one of the other personal um, experiences that you were actually talking about was uh, the big letting go. Mm, yeah, yeah. So and got, trusting somebody within the team to do what is really your baby. Yeah, that's it. Like, pr there's lots of different areas. Like, I'm very close to the product in the early days. Myself and Des would have designed all the product, pretty much every workflow in it ourselves. Whereas now we've a you know, pretty large team of developers, we've product managers, we've QA team. There's code being shipped every day and I don't get to see any of it. Sometimes in an interview I might sit in and move someone does a demo to us and I see something and I'm like, how, how the hell did that get in there? <laughs> and, uh, I'm, uh, and I'm like, and you kind of realise, okay, you, again, we have to move on past that, but it, it is difficult. Um, there was yeah. the other thing with recruiting. Yeah. You, you yeah. mentioned to me recruiting. What was a first for you just recently? Yeah, but uh, 
the company hired someone without me talking to them, um, <laughs> which was like that. Uh, I got a contract a DocuSign on my phone while I was off the last couple of weeks with, with Katie trying to help out uh, my wife. Um, but it was literally an employment contract to hire someone into one of the teams. And I was like, who's this person and what, the, what are they going to be doing? So, but yeah, we realized, yeah, again, that's the kind of thing before that. I was like, no one would get hired without myself and Des talking to them. Is it the fear of losing control? I think control to some degree, but more so cultural fit and that idea that like, okay, you're coming in to join this company. Are you the right person? Are you going to add value? Do you know why you're coming to join this company? It's not just a job, you know. Um, and again, yeah, that idea, you kind of realise, like we're lucky now, we have an excellent management team. They've all been hired in. They're very, like the culture is ingrained in them. So I'm very confident that they're not going to hire someone that I wouldn't hire. But it's still difficult. You said something really interesting to me and it really actually got me thinking because obviously you're at 85 full-time staff and by the end of the year you want to go to... 130. 130. So that's an increase of, if my maths is right, uh, yeah. 45. Yeah, yeah, we, I think we finished last year at 78. So, yeah, yeah. we had over 50 people this year. Yeah. So. And you were saying to me, it, you know, there's a concern because uh, you've, you're actually nearly doubling your workforce. Mm. So the culture that you've kind of worked so hard for is only with that original 50%. Yeah. H how do you maintain that as you grow the company? Yeah, that's something that kind of... Um, someone said to me a while ago and I kind of dawned and realised um, on a, a Leadership for Growth programme we were doing with Enterprise Ireland last year but that I started thinking about where we were I think at the time we were 80 people and I kind of realised about 40 of those people were only about 15 or 16 months with, it, with the company whereas the others were you know four or five years or whatever with, with Learn Upon so suddenly the majority of the people in the company are actually very new and, um, and they're going to set their own culture, they're going to come in over time because there's actually quite a body of those people. Um, so we, we realised that we had um, a kind of strong values and culture set in the early days and we kind of did that around 15, 20 people when we realised, okay, we need to kind of get, we knew there was something but we needed to get it down on paper. Um, and then we, we kind of had that and we always worked to those values and new people came in and we explained them and we, we outlined the behaviours that we looked for, how we do annual reviews, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But we kind of realised that all these new people were just being told this and they sort of, they had no input into it. So actually last summer uh, we, we got a, a consultant to come in and help us basically revamp our values. Um, and again it was a difficult because I quite liked where we were but to get that buy-in and uh, and get people um, understanding where these values came from in the first place. And some of them were actually no longer relevant or, or not as relevant. So that exercise we did last year was really good. And the, like afterwards, the amount of people that came, and particularly new people, felt that they had, having that input and the exercise was so worthwhile. And I think it's something we'll continue to revisit maybe every two years. Because one of, one of the other things we spoke about, because obviously... The, the recruits that you're looking for is all in the software space. Yeah. And you've got so many people and so many competitors that are actually competing with you for those same people. So how do you keep the people that you're putting the money into and investing in when yeah. you recruit them? Um, yeah, so I think a few things on that. Like we're, the benefits of growing as fast as we are is new opportunities appear all the time. Um, I, I often give the example of 18 months ago, we didn't have a product team because all the product was done by myself and Des and, uh, and we moved Lisa, who was in support, into that role as a product manager. Uh, and now she, there's three in that team, they have three open positions. And if I look out 12, 18 months, there could be 15 people in product. And that's just a team that didn't exist 18 months ago. And there's numerous other examples. So I think people in the company see that opportunity. The other area is we give people responsibility and back them to take decisions and try things. So while we're doing well and like our say marketing and sales funnel is very strong, we never sit on it. We're always trying to eke out an extra couple of percent. And the, the, te the people in the various teams, they know they can try something, they can come with it and it won't be shot down. Um, and I think when people work for a company, they want to make a contribution. They want to come in day and feel come in day to day and feel that actually what they're doing is actually has an impact in the business. Um, we also do a lot like we give the example that there's like five cogs in the wheel the way we see it. You know, there's marketing, sales, product, support, and success. 
And if any of those break, it doesn't matter how good the others are, uh, the, the, the business won't work the way it is. Um, so we, we share that message a lot and give those examples, like a quarterly stand-ups and things like that. Uh, and you can see that people suddenly realise that their role in the business matters. Uh, and I would give the example as well, if the role didn't matter, we wouldn't hurt them, you know. I have to say, I certainly felt that in going into the building, going into the office. And Brendan, when you walked out the room, you go right back and you sit in amongst all of the workers mm. and there's no special little office for you. No. You're in with them all. So just as, just as we're coming to the conclusion, there was um, just one other thing that I think was really important and it's really important when you're scaling and growing the business. And it was in conjunction with um, your experience with the programme that Enterprise Island ran um, for growth and leadership. There was a couple of key takeaways there that you might just want to share that you kind of personally experienced, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think which ones. I, I learned a lot. The program was excellent. Uh, it was the three pronged. Yeah, one so, that you, yeah. so the one of the they gave us lots of um, tools and and um, to try and to learn how to, to help manage the business as you scale. Um, but one of the ones I found really interesting was to break your time out. So to look at a week or a two week period and jot down where you spend your time. And it's broken into three areas. So there's people, um, strategy and what they call productive work. So actually doing day to day work. And at the start of the program, I was 60 percent productive work. 30% uh, people and about 10% strategy, which was, again, for where we want to get to, is completely wrong uh, as, as a CEO, that that's how my breakdown was. I think by the end of the uh, nine, 10 month program, uh, having you know got better at delegating, bringing, kind of working with my senior management team, um, I'm now in a position where I'm probably, I would say, 30% um, people still, um, about 50% strategy and 20% productive work. So, you know, not fully where I should be, but heading in the right direction. And I have to say, when I first met you, that was the first impression I got from you is you're somebody that will look in the mirror and you are somebody that will reflect and you're always on a constant focus on improving yourself to make it better for your business. Brendan, you've got a phenomenal story, and thank you so much. I feel very privileged. Thanks, Heidi. Thank, thank you, guys. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you. Okay, folks, I, I need to uh, multitask and do the chairs while inviting up our uh, panel. So if I could ask um, Joe Healy to come up from Enterprise Ireland, Debbie Rennick from ACT, John Phelan from HBAN, and Darren Mulvihill from... Crowdcube, please, and we'll have a discussion. Need another one? Yeah, we need two more, Joe, if that's all right. <coughs> We've enough room for all. All right, do you want a scanner? Yeah, very good. So thank you to Brendan and Heidi and uh, for that uh, overview. So we're, we have a panel of funders here with us this morning and the theme we're, we're looking at is, I suppose, around scaling and growing a business. If I could start with you, Joe. Um, we heard some stories from the entrepreneurs there, but from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, what are the basics around setting out on that journey to really scale up and build a global company? Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to see people haven't uh, exited the room. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose from from our perspective, maybe it's important just to say where where where, where we think scaling is and, and and the space we play in, because you heard three very interesting stories there. So we we look at kind of a three year window post the seed investment round. So the, the reason for that is that's probably the area where our tools and what's available to us can have most impact. Um, so I, I guess in terms of the scaling journey, uh, the first thing to recognize is that when you've raised funding, you've actually achieved nothing. Um, so it's, I think it's an important, and I think that came through in some of the talks. Uh, what it essentially means is that you spent most of your time not working on your business because you've been out there trying to raise the funding. So uh, one of the things we find that is a real weakness is, and it came through again, the finance piece and the cash piece. So when the funding is raised, um, and you focus back on the business, it's, it's one of the areas that it's, it's, it's one we find that uh, can be a real, real challenge for an awful lot of founders. Now, I know Travis, uh, wherever he is, uh, talked about his, his hobby and an interest in finance, which is great. 
but most people aren't like that. And the second piece then is around the sales. And if you don't have paying customers, uh, and it takes you a long time to get paying customers, then that money leaks away very, very, very quickly. And then you're back into the fundraising cycle before you've managed to really work on your business enough to get to the next fundraising piece, if that makes sense. So really, the, the, the sales piece, and, and you can't outsource the sales. You know, if, you, if, you, if it's your business, you're the person who has to sell. You're the person who has to bring in the customers. So th they're two really important bits. And that time, can that, when that clock starts ticking, when you have that seed round raised, um, it takes very, very, very quickly because you're so busy. Okay. So, so one of the things that's really important is having support. So events like this, being able to talk to, to founders, we have our own founders forum, events like that where you can meet people who are on the journey with you. And then one of the other things that's the corollary of that is, is something that was mentioned, I think, by Adrian, is that you, know, you really need to start your stakeholder, your investor management from day one. You know, don't leave it till things uh, have, have taken a turn and, and suddenly things have nosedive. You need to be communicating regularly. So if you do uh, all these things, I don't think I don't think they're they're particularly rocket science, but it doesn't mean they're easy to do. You know, they're difficult things to do when you're full on in a startup business, and we recognise that, which is why we have events like this. We try and support you, but I would say the focus after the seed round is critical for the first two or three years. And Debbie, you said to me, we were just chatting briefly about this notion of your five minutes from huge That's success and terrible huge failure. failure. I said I wasn't going to name companies because <laughs> there's companies that can be struggling away and they haven't made it, but then they find their way. It takes time. And then there's other companies that are doing great and then they hit bumps on the road. So it's never, it's rarely, I mean, sometimes it is, but it's rarely a straight line to success. I mean, <clears throat> and I <clears throat> always say this to, to, to our companies, you know, y the issue in terms of, you know, hitting bumps on the road and success and failure. I mean, the issue is how you react to uh, bumps on the road. What do you do? The issue, you need to make decisions quickly. You may make the wrong decision, but then you need to make another decision to correct that. And it's about being um, decisive and clear and, and, and following a path and being committed. Um, and I mean, I agree with what Joe just said there. I mean, we would always say as well, I mean, the cheapest source of finance is sales. That is the cheapest source of finance because obviously it's bringing cash flow in. But secondly, the more you can show your ability to sell, the more you're going to attract investors. You know, in terms of attracting investors, you know, we, we need to be able to see that, you know, the company can sell, the founders can sell. And, and selling incorporates many different elements. It's can they sell a vision? Can they sell a story? Can they, you know, paint a picture of an opportunity that we think looks really interesting? It looks like they've got a vision for an opportunity that we want to back. And, you know, we as investors back companies from very early stage in terms of seed investing, a couple of hundred thousand che checks, all the way through expansion and growth to several millions. But, but the criteria are pretty much the same in terms of the vision and the story that we want to hear. And, and, and it's about a big enough market opportunity and seeing a team and, and, and hearing from a team. And, and again, touching on some of the comments earlier, usually the, the most successful companies are where there's a connection between product market and team. And the intersection of that is very often, it's a pain point that they experienced in their career. It's domain knowledge, it's sector knowledge, that they have identified an opportunity that there's a gap in the market. And it's an interesting gap in the market in a big market, as Brendan uh, pointed out earlier on. It's a, it may be a crowded market, but the reason it's crowded is because it's a very big market. So when you're articulating that, that type of story, you need to show how your domain knowledge and your experience um, is actually filling that gap. Um, okay. John, I'm interested in uh, just picking up something Debbie said and, and Joe about the bumps in the road as you're you're kind of starting off, you're going on the journey, and there's what are some of those bumps that you've seen along the way? Thinking about it from the companies that HBAN has invested in, your own personal experience, you know, what are the two or three big bumps that are coming, and what, how does the the entrepreneur overcome them? I guess uh, the financing side, when you think you're, 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 you're on a journey to, to a sales path, which you think is going to go to here, here, and here, that's a logical path. You get in, you do a prototype, then you get into trial, then you get into full engagement, and you get into your AOR. Suddenly, you're in with a multinational who has a different view of the world in terms of time scales and how long it takes to get things done. And I was just talking to Adrian there that you think you have something done, which you think is going to close out in three months, and then <coughs> two years later, you're still talking to the guys. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a big bump in the road. Um, but you can see that it, it is five minutes there. It's going to be here. It's coming, but it's just not coming now. 
Uh, so that will be one. Uh, technology bump will be another one. Um, having technology at a very early stage <clears throat> developed for a certain size and then being able to scale that up to a, a much larger size and to scale out. So that technology scale and then the business model in terms of how can you scale the business model as well. Okay. They're, they're all sort of... Of the big ones that are coming on the on the road to scale. Yeah, mm. I think one of the big. To be honest, I think one of the biggest issues um, that companies face is it's hiring. It's actually hiring well. It's when you miss hire because that can really set a company back. There's a huge opportunity cost if you've made a senior hire that doesn't work out. It takes six months to find out that they're useless, and then you have to get rid of them, and then you have to find somebody else. Mm. And <clears throat> you know, again, I think again it comes back to the 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 original founders and the founding team. I mean, the first ten hires are really critical. Um, and then when you're beginning to scale internationally, if you're expanding into new markets, the hires you make there are really critical. And it can often be the case that where companies have been cash starved for a <coughs> long time, living on a wing and a prayer and fresh air, and then they raise cash and then they're in a mad rush to hire. And, and we'd always say, you know, yes, you need, you need to make your hires, but hire carefully, hire your next layer of management carefully because you're going to start losing you're not going to be as close. Like you're not going to be as close to the the, the next layer, the next layer, as the we next saw layer. Brendan as Brendan said, so yeah. you really need to make sure that that those early hires who are going to be doing the next level of hires are the right hires. Otherwise, that really can set you back. Um, Particularly, I'd imagine with a you know your first salesperson, and yeah. if you get the wrong one, there's a six month ramp up That's before right. they start paying for themselves, and you pick right. the wrong one, and, and you pick the wrong one, and then you have to go again. You're twelve um, months out. That's right, and it does depend on each business and business model i mean it depends on whether you know i mean if you've if you're able to <clears throat> sell predominantly from inside sales or whether it's an enterprise sale where you're actually having to hire people who are meeting customers you know very often we'd say if it's what if it's an enterprise sale and you're uh, you know expanding into a new market we would always say get someone from within over yourself or somebody else who you know understands the company the product the culture the type of customer the target customer do that yourself because so many times uh, if people hire somebody on the ground, they sound fantastic, they're selling a big pitch and they're not the right fit. Um, you know, and, and, and time and time again, we would say, go over yourself first, go over and scope the ground, you know, understand the market yourself. There, there are always some, there's always differences yeah. and you need to make sure that when you go into a new market, the product market fit is as you think it is and test and test until you actually start scaling up again. Super. Darren, I see you nodding there. Um, welcome. It's the first time I think we've had you <coughs> at our uh, funding and scaling. You're very welcome. Absolutely. Delighted to be here. How's Crowdcube going? You, I think I mentioned the GC about 12 months ago. Yeah. You, were, you were just getting started. Absolutely. So um, just to kind of give everyone a little bit of background. So I work for Crowdcube, a UK-based uh, equity <coughs> crowdfunding investment platform. Um, so basically what that means is, is that we help companies raise uh, I suppose investment from a number of different sources of, of, of investors. So whether it's your customers, your community, um, you know, our crowd of investors, of which we have just under 800,000 registered investors, um, and obviously from your own kind of network of, of high net worths and so on as well. So um, we were founded in, in Exeter in the west coast of England uh, about eight years ago, um, and we were the first platform really to do this in the world. Uh, and we went from, I suppose, starting off in that kind of very much the small kind of pre-seed side of the market, doing an average deal of about 60K. Um, and if you look back at, at Q4 last year, our average raise size was about £940,000. Um, and uh, and ultimately, we, we co-fund with, with, you know, various different parties like institutions and, and angels and high net worths. And, and we can really help you consolidate a lot of different sources of capital and, ha and allow your customers to become involved in the business and to pick up some new customers as well as some new investors as well. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, the reason I was nodding with, with Debbie was really to go back to the point of um, one thing that you said when you came in was that idea of, um, I suppose, tech uh, really on not understanding, you know, what's how, when it comes to scale, what is it that's, you know, preventing you from going to the next level? And it reminded me, interestingly, of, of our own situation over the last four years. So we're an eight year old company. Um, when we, in 2014 and 15, we had raised our first kind of VC rounds. Um, we were doing bigger and bigger deals on our platform. And, and ultimately we had a ceiling where we, we were only able to launch a certain number of pitches in a month, a week, a quarter, a year. Um, and we realized that it wasn't the market. It wasn't our people. 
Um, it wasn't the quality of the companies that we were putting on the platform, it was our tech and our process. And uh, we spent the whole of 2017 understanding from each stakeholder within Crowdcube and from obviously from users and investors, um, you know, where the pain points were and building a, a process that kind of removed a lot of the friction, a lot of the bottlenecks in the process so we could actually launch more businesses on the platform. Um, and if you look back at last year, we saw some the beginning of the fruits of that um, and we raised uh, just over 143 million pounds last year, uh, up about 50% from the year before. Uh, whereas we had been flatlining effectively for the, the three years previous to that. So I know I'm kind of talking about our experience as a company, but um, it's about figuring out when your tech is maybe bulging at the seams uh, and that your process is not allowing you to scale in the way that you know you're ex you and your investors expect you to. And uh, I suppose doing the hard yards, a lot of the people that set up the process and the tech in the first place are not often not the people <coughs> that are, are going, to going to move it on to, the, move next it on to the next level. Yeah. Joe, Enterprise Ireland has invested in lots of really successful companies over the years. What sets the really successful ones aside? The ones that go, so there's companies will set up, there's some that will scale here in Ireland, and then there's one that will become the big superstars. What sets them apart? Is there something from your view that you look back and think, yeah, when I met such and such, they had the building blocks, they, uh, they had the attitude, they had the... Is there anything that you would call yeah. out and say? So, so what I would say is that you're, you're, there are certain characteristics um, which are likely to suggest you'll be more successful. You won't always be the case. Uh, when we look back over the last, I don't know, five or six years, and it relates back to the point Debbie made, um, certainly experience counts for a lot that's relevant. So you don't have to necessarily have startup experience, but maybe managing people in the business area in which you want to do your startup. Um, and what we find is people who, who have that industry knowledge, that sector knowledge, they tend to have good, um, good networks. They tend to know who, who, who's likely to buy. They tend to know why. So a lot of relevant experience is in there. And if they've managed uh, in the area in which they want to do the setup and their current business, it's either too small a market or it's a bit adjacent to it, they're likely to know the people who could work with them, who help them get the project off the ground. So an awful lot of, of, of what's required um, is helped by your own personal network and having some personal capital, because I know, I know that the, you know, living off savings can, can be an issue as well, the bootstrapping piece. So it doesn't guarantee it, but, but if, if you have had a good oversight in the industry in which you're setting up your startup, you've probably got good view as to what's a good market opportunity and how well that market is performing or whether something has been ignored. So quite often we see people digitizing something that is a traditional industry, whether it's a process. So maybe the, the check ventry story is a good, is a good one there. Um, if you have made a reputation and a name in a particular industry, you're more likely to be able to attract people and persuade them to work with you for nothing. Uh, that's a very important talent, <laughs> how you get something for nothing for longer than you might reasonably expect. So when things take twice or three times as long, you've managed to convince them to stay with you, whereas somebody else might only get three months. So there, there are things there which don't guarantee it, but it also means you have the credibility when you come to talk to people about the space that you want to set up your business in, because you have experience, you have managed people, you probably have some technical and or commercial experience. So if those factors are missing, it doesn't mean to say you can't make it as a startup, but it becomes more challenging because, you know, when you look internationally, uh, and if you have, if you had a thousand pounds in your wallet today, you know, are you going to give it to a 22-year-old who has never done it before but is brilliant at presenting, or are you going to give it to somebody who's 42, who has a track record, experience, done something similar before, maybe on their second journey? And I suppose the other thing that's interesting maybe in the last five years is that we have an increasing number of, um, of people who are going again. So we're almost getting to a stage now where I think where we have some critical mass in terms of the number of startups. So we would be funding um, at seed round and supporting companies, you know, broadly speaking, around 100 every year, which is a very large number of companies um, for the last number of years. So as people are successful, you know, a founder isn't going to give it up because it's in the blood. So they'll either go again or they'll start working with startups. So as we get more of that, that expertise, that knowledge, those networks, the, the willingness to give something back, being involved in mentoring, uh, even some investing, some of the more successful people go in and be institutional investors. So I think as, as a country, we're developing that. 
and the, and the consequence of that is that um, we're better at knowing what sort of startups we should fund at seed. So while we're still doing a big volume game, whereas somebody like Debbie uh, would maybe be focusing on a relatively smaller number of projects, um, I think the quality, st we're sustaining quality, in fact improving it over the, the range of projects. Bearing in mind, there's always a, a, a variation, but we're looking to try and, you know, there's more tools available. And now we're having international VCs coming to Ireland as well, and they're coming here because there's more than one project. They wouldn't come here. So we've had a couple of international VCs putting boots on the ground here. So in the same way we're saying to people, you should put, put boots on the ground if you're serious about building overseas. If you want to be an investor, you have, put, have to put boots on the ground. And they wouldn't be coming to a, a rock off a rock off Europe if there wasn't something. We so weren't doing something the, right. There's right? something here, we're doing so, something right. We're doing so which, so uh, it's a long-winded way of saying that you know, there are characteristics which should say, no, I think, and it comes down to the people at the very start, and, and what does that mean? It means that they're credible, and why are they credible for the reasons I've outlined? But it doesn't mean to say that you can't do it if you're 22. It yeah. just means you know, it, it, the odds are higher, the more relevant experience, the more relevant connections, the more relevant networks, the more relevant um, uh, people you have and experience in the space. Very good. John, from the angel side, what are the angels looking for? Where are they fitting in on this journey to scale? I suppose that it's maturing is the reality. Uh, probably like everywhere is maturing. Uh, so what we saw maybe 10 years ago was angels investing at a very early stage, pre-seed, pre-revenue companies, a small amount of money. Now what we're beginning to see is that the syndicates are coming together. And when you bring syndicated amounts of money together, it's a bit like CrowdCube, but just on a smaller level, is that the average amount of money going in, we saw 50% of, of all the investments last year were 25 grand or less from individuals, but we had far more of them going into companies. We have one, one company going through at the moment, which has 48 investors in. It's putting in close to 2 million, which brings a lot more power to the table. So you have a, they're able to come in at a later stage as well and contribute to the follow on round rather than just have that early stage seed as well. So it's all evolving. I think in the States it's evolving even more again. And in the EU we see it evolving too. So yeah, I think, I think, oh, we all need each other is the reality so i think in terms of you have the vc side of it you have the privates coming in as well you have the state side as well and we saw three years ago or four years ago we had we had eio be in for 250 act be in for, for 250 and they have privates in for 250 that sort of fell away a bit recently but you can see that coming back okay i'm just out of time <coughs> I see emma nodding me there debbie um one piece of advice i'm in the audience i'm starting a business or i'm scaling a business What's the critical thing that I need to be thinking about over the next six to nine months? Um, I think hiring well. I think hiring well, uh, getting the right initial team is the most important because that's that's your starting point. It's who you're working with in those early days. I think I think hiring well because it's if you make mistakes with that, it sets you back. And it goes back to Joe's point is about investing in the people and finding the team, and that's what kind of the absolutely. And also, I would say, I mean, I think it was Sam Walton who said the customer is ultimately the boss of every single company. They can fire the chairman from the chairman down, and that is absolutely true. And and in our experience, we've invested in over 150 companies, and I would say that the companies that are the most successful are the ones that, from that early stage all the way through as they grow, they never lose touch with the customer, the product, the market. They never lose touch with that even though you know the founder may be a little bit, he, he obviously has built a company as it goes, but he makes sure that the people he's hiring, that in the, co in the company, that culture is ingrained. You need to stay close to your customer and the market and make sure that the product is evolving with the market need. Very good. And Darren, last word to you uh, as a relatively new entrant. Mm -hmm. um, what's critical for the entrepreneur <coughs> in coming onto the platform to raise funds? What do they need to do? Um, so I think there's two things. Uh, I think the first thing is talk to the platforms. Um, so if you're thinking about crowdfunding or even speculatively thinking that it might be for you, talk to the platforms, understand you know what's involved in the process, what are the expectations of you and what you should you expect from the platforms, get a feeling for different models and how it works. Um, there's no better way of educating yourself than talking to me or six or nine months before you even need to actively go out to the market. Uh, and really either ruling it in or ruling it out. So that's very simple kind of uh, advice, but that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, and one of the things that sets, I suppose, a lot of the companies on our platform apart, the ones that raise maybe larger amounts or raise, a lar raise from a larger amount of investors are ones that 
I think it goes to your point about customers is um, they show a very three-dimensional view of where they're at as a business. And what I mean by that is um, when it comes to their crowdfunding content and the campaign, they have everything from the chairman to the, the head of partnerships of the company that's delivering them new customers and beginning to show dividends on that side. They have customers and users in the video talking about the utility and the joy perhaps that they've experienced as a result of the product that the company is, is selling. Um, and they have maybe previous or lead investors, um, you know, basically backing and associating with the campaign as well. Um, so I think a great example would be a company that we funded here about two years ago now called uh, How's My Dog, which is a pet services marketplace, recently announced a, a merger in, in, in Spain. Um, but they would have had everything for everyone from Enterprise Ireland down to their local angel here in Dublin to NDRC and, and various different partners that they were working with. <coughs> in the video, not just, you know, infused throughout the content of the campaign. So show a three dimensional view and show the people behind the people that are uh, that are basically just to show the crowd and to show people that maybe investing a material amount of money in you through a platform, but maybe won't have the time to get to know you and really understand, you know, what makes the business tick. Um, show them that there's a real business there. And the, the best way of doing that is not just showing the product and the team, but also showing Make it deeper, customers. tell the story. Exactly, and validate that those customers are there. Very good, thank you. Debbie, Darren, Joe, and John, thank you very much. And uh, a round of applause for them. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, thank you. I'll just ask Michael Culligan, CEO of Dublin Bic, to close us off with a few remarks, and then please stay around for networking. Please stay around, and let's catch up. Michael, thanks. Connor, thank you. Uh, morning, all, and thanks. Maybe just a couple of minutes to wrap up, starting with a few thank yous. The funding and skating series um, by Dublin Bic is supported by Facebook, who hosted us here this morning. Um, OBH Partners, Orla O'Brien, who's here with us. Uh, UK DIT, John O'Loughlin, um, is here with us also this morning. Um, and um, finally, Mark Lowry, of course, of Smith and Williamson, who, who was with us a little bit earlier. Thanks to our own team who put this together, um, led by um, Emma and Laura, of course. The funding, our role at Dublin Business Innovation Centre is to empower entrepreneurs to start and scale business. The organisation has been around for a period of time, 30 years. I guess in the ca past couple of years, you know, we brought a few new things to the market. One of those is the funding and scaling series. And the purpose of it really, I suppose, is to show showcase and learn from the companies that go through our own Investor Ready program. And before we come to this morning's ones, I mean, this series started a couple of years ago, and the kind of companies we've had on it to date include the likes of Forrest, Verona and Percival, Tauglas, uh, Ronan Quinlan, and Bright Bill, Alan Coleman, Glow Fox, Connor O'Loughlin, Health Beacon with Jim Joyce, iCabby, Gavin Walsh, Mix Garage with um, Kieran Crean, uh, House My Dog, actually, who um, Darden. Um, give you guys a fantastic plug at a previous one of these, uh, uh, Crowdcube, and it's phenomenal to see the growth in Crowdcube over years. I remember meeting your colleague and founder, Darden Westlake, at one of the EBAN European Business Angel events four or five years ago uh, when you were on the emb embryonic stages. So all these companies have come through the Investor Ready program. So if you do have no young companies out there who are thinking of going on the journey, do point them in our direction. We work very closely, obviously, in partnership with Enterprise Ireland on that. So this morning, um, you know, I have no pressure for um, um, Travis and uh, Brian and Lisa, but you know, the first time I met Travis, which is I guess back in 2017, it was said earlier, you know, we knew we were we had something very very special there, and it's phenomenal and fantastic to see the guys building that business out of Ireland, and I really really think that. You know, first of all, the first thing I suppose is the vision, absolute clarity in terms of their vision to build a global leading game um, out of Ireland and going about it then, you know, in a really uh, skilled and profession professional way. And I consider in Ireland, you know, we have an animation industry, I suppose, maybe just to put a parallel for a moment with the gaming industry. We have an animation industry that started here in Ireland about 30 years ago or thereabouts when Sullivan Blues came in from the States and then with Ballyfermer College of Further Education, you had a whole range of young companies that started back in the day, the likes of Boulder Media, Jam Media, um, Brown Bragg Films, Cahill Gaffney, and there's a whole range of others now. So we've built a serious indigenous um, animation industry. We haven't quite yet got there with the gaming industry. We have a lot of big international players, the right games, EA games and such like here. We do have a range of indie or small companies and a few guys starting to pop up. But I think with the likes of Vila Games and the likes of Black Shamrock, 
you know, who came here a couple of years ago, are up to 70 or 80 people now and a few others. I think we're on the cusp of that um, industry growing. So it's fantastic um, to see Vila here. Adrian Walsh, check for entry. Adrian, you know, your honesty was just phenomenally refreshing in terms of the lessons and some fantastic lessons there for us. Um, I suppose the best thing I would say about Brendan and the journey he has learned upon uh, it's probably two things again, absolute vision and clarity and confidence in their own. But, you know, what an understated leader and, you know, dealing with that transition now from, you know, being doing everything on the ground and focusing more on the strategy. Um, so, you know, absolutely fantastic to see. Wish you guys the very, very best. Four million users worldwide is just phenomenal. Um, finally, on closing, I think maybe the last time when we were at Facebook, we launched our um, Future Scope event. We've had a very busy week, I should have said, at Dublin BIC. Some of you will have seen that um, last week, on yesterday or last week, um, we're really pleased that after a couple of years plus of work, we've uh, announced uh, the launch uh, and expansion of our Guinness Enterprise um, Centre, which is managed by ourselves at Dublin BIC. Already 450 people there. We've announced a 10 million project to double the size of that. And our vision for that is extremely clear to be a global entrepreneurial super hub. And that was on uh, Wednesday last week. On Thursday last week, um, we had the HBAN annual Business Angel Conference with John and colleagues. We had over 300 people. And that was following being with Joe Healy and his team in Crow Park that morning for a fantastic event in, in the startup area. And obviously, we have our funding and scaling this morning. Um, next up, I guess, is a future scope event, which we referred to before. There are flyers on your seats. And some, some of you are fairly familiar with it now. I think it's positioning, you know, as Ireland's number one innovation event. Starts off with a morning stage of main insights showing really top world-class innovation out of Ireland. And then for the rest of the day, we have a range of stages, collaboration, entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity meets technology, where you engage in great detail with some super panels, super entrepreneurs, etc. So without further ado, probably taking a couple of minutes too long there. Um, thanks to everybody who's been here this morning, um, and particular to our entrepreneurs. And go, ne go network. Thanks, folks. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, folks. Apologies. I had one more. Apologies. My as, a, as, as the young lad say, my bad. Sorry. I had a quick, sh a quick shout out just before, before, you, bef before you go. Sorry. A quick shout out. Um, our... Um, partners at Dublin, uh, Dublin Business Innovation Centre, Dublin City Council are here this morning and they've put together something fairly innovative, which is a circular economy training programme. It's targeted as SMEs and the whole idea is there is embedding design, design for manufacturing, supply chain and process development methodologies from an early stage. They have a small limited number of places available on the training programmes put together and um, Steve Nogara and his colleague Michaela Fernando are here outside after. If that's of interest to you or anyone you know, please link up with Stephen. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank you.